Yeah, hi to everybody. Today I'm going to talk about um, the concept of an intervention. This is a common term in instructional design, but I realize that people outside of my field of instructional design may not totally be familiar with this term with respect to education. So here's a little discussion. Um, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney in the 1940s when they made movies, they would be teenagers uh, kind of uh, having fun. And then one of them would be inspired and they'd say, let's have a party. And the other would say, oh, great idea. And then they would go launching into this effort to have fun and have party and dancing and food and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'd like to make a little comparison and suggest that in that same inspired way that Judy and, and Mickey said, let's have a party, sometimes in educational interventions can come from such a simple place of people just being inspired that there's a need, there's a desire, let's go do an intervention. Um, the dictionary t term and dictionary definitions talk about various kinds of meanings of interventions. As you well know, it, means, can, it can mean different things. For my purposes, I'd like to think of intervention as some kind of concrete program product, set of materials, some kind of system that's created to achieve some kind of positive effect. It's a concrete notion. It's something. It's a thing. I think in instructional design, it's part of what we call the post-instructional turn, where at some point in the 70s, I think, we realized that um, instruction is costly and detached from reality, detached from a job detached from the real world sometimes, and that can have advantages, but it can also have disadvantages. And when you look at workplace learning, professional learning, so often uh, instruction has can be part of a solution along with other things. So I might sit for a training, but I might also be looking at job, job redesign, have improved methods of supervision and assessment, um, and so forth. So we, th we think of that as, you know, not just instruction, and that relates to the performance improvement movement or field in, in my field of instructional design. Also, it relates, it, it also has this underlying implicit idea that uh, there's a product, there's a pill that I can take to fix my problem. It's similar to a medical treatment. So in that case, the intervention idea, that it's a medical intervention, is not so foreign or strange because there's an implicit idea sometimes that we're trying to create fixes. We're trying to create treatments that will fix a problem. And, of course, that's very positivist in its, uh, in its underpinnings. It assumes kind of a closed system of causes and effects and doesn't allow for things to be messy and, and uh, dynamic. But there's that underlying assumption with that term. And we're using that term, but we're also aware of its, of its uh, implicit bias. So where, does, where do interventions come from? As I mentioned, the Mickey and, and Judy origins, it may be uh, an inspired thing. But let's first talk about how an intervention can be very rationally planned. A top-down design, where you start from a clear assessment of needs that involves data collection. You go through a rational process of planning and development. You work from objectives or essential questions. You build in assessment of, of uh, evaluation and data collection. You very carefully, carefully analyze parts as part of the process. That's, you know, that would be a, a top-down approach to a problem. And then working from design principles that are consistent with that, we work from a deficit or a gap analysis what between the real and the ideal. We would apply problem-solving models where we look for, look, uh, formulate a problem, identify a need or a problem, and then work through a process of developing a solution that would be appropriate for that. Uh, there's, uh, in instructional design, we call that, uh, we often talk about the ADDI model of analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation, where things are successively realized, successively developed, and evaluated. 
But you know what? Uh, just like Mickey and Judy, there's a bottom-up energy that we don't want to ignore also in an intervention, uh, in the creation of interventions. So when you're local, when you're in a local situation and you see with your own eyes a problem, you're observing a, a situation or a need, that can often lead to a local action and ins inspiration. So community building, local, uh, the influence of local, individual local agents who are helping to address a problem, building and helping in, in constructive ways. Sometimes you might be resisting an outside change that's not good. Uh, it might have an insurgency quality to it. Um, and nowadays with the web, our web, uh, wisdom of the web, where we involve, we get people and movements connected online, and that creates energy of its own also. So principles uh, and, and models that would be used in that bottom-up approach it would include community organizing models and principles, like the kind that Solowinski advocated, change management principles, the idea of principled resistance. Sometimes um, you look for, look for other successful models where people have resisted an unwanted change and draw uh, lessons from that, as well as the web principles of crowdsourcing and the wisdom of the web, self-organizing efforts uh, that people can do together. The, um, when you really compare them, you can see that they're, they're different, they're complementary. In some situations, you would apply one or the other, and you don't want to neglect uh, the potential of either one of these approaches to, to change that you're looking for, for positive impacts that an intervention might, might seek. So what makes a good intervention? Well, the first point is be connected to a worthwhile cause. Uh, have a, have, be clear about your convictions and your, your need and your uh, intentions. That's, I think, a starting point. And then clarify, you know, the kind of uh, the kind of intervention, or the kind of outcome that we're looking for, and learning in our focus on professional learning is the most obvious one. And learning often suggests instruction, but as we talked about earlier, not always do we need to have a formal instructional intervention. Sometimes we look for some kind of job performance uh, redesign, some kind of performance improvement plan to help people directly in their job situations. Uh, social justice and equity outcomes are also part and parcel of, a good of, of many good interventions. And in those cases, we might look for some structural reforms in the culture of the politics uh, and engage those, uh, those needs directly through not educational efforts so much, as other kinds of reforms. I'm adding a, a category I'm calling spiritual renewal because sometimes people find themselves burnt out or uh, empty, isolated, not connected with other people successfully. And those might require uh, some direct attention as well. So re just this table looks complex, but I'm just repeating those same points on the left two columns. And I'm suggesting here that um, for these different kinds of interventions, some of them, look, notice the right column, lend themselves to top-down types of interventions. Very often a learning instructional type of uh, intervention might, you not, might want to do a careful top-down analysis, make sure you're taking care of all the details. The same is true with performance improvement plans. Other kinds of issues might naturally be more energized from the bottom up. I don't want to overstate that, but I think there is that tendency. Note that uh, many interventions, uh, and I'm, I'm starting with the idea on the left here of bottom-up interventions, tend to be hard to measure and account for. But all interventions have subtle effects, no matter if it's direct kind of instructional uh, event or something. Every intervention has subtle effects on the, uh, that can resist measurement we need to be very careful about, you know, unintended outcomes um, and, and so forth. So by, here's the concluding points, is the effective positive change uh, is, is a wonderful 
goal. It can be harder to achieve than we expect at the start of something. Policy can help us create some positive conditions that are conducive to change. Finding good theory, uh, research and theory can guide us. And procedural models like ADDI, change models, um, and so forth, problem solving uh, models can halt help in the management of the process. But I believe that the devil is in the details. And what I mean by that is the particular participants, the place in its history, the caring and commitment of individuals and communities uh, are the core of positive change. We call it an intervention because it has specific boundaries and trappings of, of structure. But the bottom line, it's the people and the place and the history that makes the big difference and can make a good theory work. It can make a good procedure, careful procedure, careful attention to detail, really be inhabited and have a good outcome. So that's my story. I hope that's helpful to you in understanding why we talk about interventions and the detail, the, the benefits of talking about specific programs and systems and how they come to, to come to be. Thank you. I think, uh, I think it's a viable idea as long as we take a critical stance and know the issues surrounding. Have a good day. Bye-bye.